Chris Webster here, and I just wanted to thank all the people that are members of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Of course, our shows are always free, and members are what help keep them free. Other shows are on Patreon and similar sites and make you pay for content, not at the APN. If you want a little extra and want to give back, then head over to arcpodnet.com slash members. That's arcpodnet.com slash members to support archaeological education and outreach. Let's start the episode. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode three of a Life in Ruins podcast. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Connor Yohain and David Howe. <laughs> Tonight's guest, Emily Van Alst, is a descendant of Lakota Sioux Nation and works avidly in public outreach. Although the Lakota and Pawnee are historical enemies, Carlton and Emily have chosen to put aside their tribal differences to deliver our listeners an awesome <laughs> episode. <laughs> Emily got started at Yale University and she is currently a PhD student at Indiana University Bloomington. Her research interests include rock art, gender, indigenous archaeology, public archaeology, indigenous feminism, and ethnography. As a goal of this podcast is to provide our listeners with multifaceted approaches to archaeology, we are super excited to talk with Emily tonight. So let's count some coup and get this episode started. <laughs> Well, hello, Emily, and thanks for being on the podcast. Um, just to start off, could you talk about your kind of early childhood and or at least just give us the basic introduction of who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. So my sort of background, I am a Ph.D. student at Indiana University um, where I'm working on uh, my Ph.D. in archaeology my focus is on indigenous women's sort of interaction and participation in the creation of rock art on the Northern Plains. So present day, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I grew up in Northern Maine um, in a small town called Bridgewater. There was about 450 people growing up in my town. And then I moved to Connecticut when um, I was in middle school because my dad decided to pursue a PhD um, in Compilate and Cultural Studies at UConn. So I normally call myself a suburban Indian because <laughs> I didn't really grow up on the res and I didn't really grow up in a city, so I can't consider myself an urban Indian, but I definitely consider myself a suburban Indian since I kind of grew up in the suburbs of Connecticut until I went to college. So growing up in Maine, I was the only Native kid in my class, um, and that was pretty much the deal for middle school and high school. And it was kind of a weird experience because anytime we talked about Native issues, it was like everyone turned and looked at me, whatever classroom it was. And so, yeah, growing up in a small town and being the only Native person could was definitely difficult growing up. Um, but it kind of gave me the tools to talk about Native issues, which is what I'm really passionate about today. And you are a descendant of the Lakota Nation, not a tribal citizen, correct? Correct. I am not enrolled, um, but I do uh, my ceremonies with my family on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in Porcupine, South Dakota. So for someone who's non-Native, could you kind of explain like what the difference between what you just said is? So being enrolled means that um, you're a citizen of that tribal nation um, versus being unenrolled. Um, so People who are enrolled or unenrolled both have sort of heritage and have families and are part of Native communities. But enrollment basically means you're a citizen and it may come with um, an enrollment card, so a tribal ID, which I don't have since I'm not enrolled. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have that connection to that community. Gotcha. And that brings up a really interesting point, um, especially in the modern context of talking about indigenous issues, because like I didn't know that you weren't enrolled um, just because of how active and, and like how much you participate in Lakota culture and, and, and stuff. And so there's kind of like this, it's, I wouldn't say it's a tiered system because that would rank people, but there's definitely kind of like three groups of people that claim themselves to be indigenous. And you have your enrolled members um, who get the tribal ID card and they uh, as well as they can participate directly within the nation, like voting, um, especially in right. my case, I'm enrolled. So I get a vote, which is great and, uh, you know, participate. And then you have the descendants who are actively 
engaged in the community, there might be a blood quantum uh, mm-hmm. requirement that that prohibits people from being like tribally enrolled, but they still participate in active members. And then you have like this third group, which I like to call the uh, and this this comes from a Charlie Hill. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a he's a Native American comedian, what he calls the uh, pretendians or the generic keys, <laughs> people that <laughs> people, Sorry. especially on the East Coast, who have who claim to have native heritage through like some distant grandmother who always, who's always like nine times out of 10, like, yeah, my (laughs) great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. And it's like, that's adorable. You have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) Um, But like, that's, and I I just want to like mention that, that, you know, even though you might not be enrolled, you're definitely a member of of the Lakota nation. And and, like, it's just awesome the amount of work that you do um, with the nation itself. So just like for our listeners out there that these things, differences do exist and you shouldn't base your assumptions on somebody claiming native heritage just on the fact that they're enrolled or not, because we have people like Emily who are doing amazing work and helping out their nation. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting sort of family story. I was telling Carlton about this the other day, but basically when the settlers came out and they were settling, (laughs) uh, my family left with Sitting Bull up to Canada. And when Sitting Bull decided to go back down to the United States, my family apparently decided not to do that. They didn't want to go back and deal with the government. So they stayed in Canada for a couple generations. Um, And then they came down through Michigan. And that's when one of my ancestors um, married a fur trapper with the last name Van Alst. And that's how I have that last name. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And then my dad grew up in Chicago, total urban Indian. Um, And so it's not necessarily that my family's been removed. It's just like they weren't there when they decided to, you know, do the census and uh, put down all the the native people on the rolls essentially. And so that is technically why I'm not enrolled um, is because I was never on, my family wasn't on the rolls. Um, They decided to, to move and go away from that. So it's interesting sort of the choices that native people have made um, and our ancestors have made in the past to sort of resist colonialism. And so people have really interesting family stories when it comes to, to that. And it has some, obviously some real, implications today. And so, yeah, there are these different groups of Native people who have had very um, interesting and different experiences. So we have a a somewhat similar thing that goes on with the Pawnee Nation is that the Pawnees that decided not to move um, from Nebraska to Oklahoma were not, they're not included on the rolls. Like they were allowed to stay, Mm -hmm. but they were, you know, they had to give up all claims to being basically like the Pawnee tribe itself. So there's a bunch of them running around Nebraska who have no I mean, they're, they're basically cut off. There's really no, yeah. they don't have any connection anymore. And that's funny that you say that your last name comes from a French trapper because that's where my last name comes from. It's also a French trapper. Oh, of course, because yeah. that's how people got last names back in the day. <laughs> exactly. I was like a great grandmother. Um, she, after my great grandfather died, she'd remarried a French trapper with the last name Gauvet. They never had kids, but during the renaming act, her name was already Gauvet. So they just named all the kids uh, Gauvet, in which is the English is Gover. So that's how that that came about. Wow, that's cool. Uh, that's super interesting. Um, so you said that your uh, father decided to get a PhD in, was it cultural? Sorry, I, I missed. Com- comparative literature and cultural studies. Dang. Oh, very cool. So yeah. that's a, that seems like a very interesting kind of major, something to study. Um, so did you have any really early, is that kind of related to anthropology or is there, did you have any early interactions with anthropology um, kind of through that? Yeah, um, my dad went back to school when I was probably like 11. Um, and so some of my earliest memories is him going back to college um, and education being very, very important in our house. Um, and so because his undergrad was actually in behavioral sciences, he was reading a lot of psych and sociology, but he was also reading a lot of anthropology. And so it's interesting when I when I got to college and I started taking anthro theory classes, you know, I was kind of familiar with, you know, Durkheim and Walter Benjamin because dad had been reading that when I was younger. And so my dad's focus is really um, the representation of native people in film and television is one of his main focuses as um, as well as native literature. Um, And so, you know, growing up, we, I read a lot of, Native books. We watched a lot of movies where Native people were represented. 
sometimes not in the best ways, aka Westerns. <laughs> um, but it was interesting, you know, being in that sort of environment that we, my family was constantly reading and watching movies and doing, and doing those sort of academic things um, and looking at things in a very academic lens. Um, and so when I got to college, um, I tried like 12 different majors um, and I finally decided with anthropology because um, I was very interested in how Native people represented themselves. And I think that's kind of why I've moved into really looking at rock art um, as part of my dissertation. That's super cool. So what is rock art? What is rock art? Uh, rock art, for my definition, is human-made um, paintings or and or carvings on a rock surface at the most basic sort of scientific level. But I would say that it also has a lot of meaning and this sort of images we see are, are could be could be symbolic. They don't necessarily have to be, but there's definitely human meaning onto those images. So for the audience listening, what would you say is like, just quickly, the difference between rock art and cave art, or are they the same thing? They can be the same thing. Okay. Um, sometimes, though, we see, especially in Northern Plains rock art, um, it's not necessarily um, rock art that is painted or carved in a cave. It can be on like a butte or it can even be um, on a stone that's just been left like on the plains. So it doesn't necessarily gotcha. have to be within a cave. And then there's um, art, though that is pretty common. Um sort of across the world. People have the tendency to create art in more isolated, rock art anyway, in more isolated areas on the landscape. So like, just a quick question, how has the um, Lakota Nation received um, your research and the work that you do? Because like, as you're well aware, um, archaeology in the field of anthropology itself within um, indigenous communities is not highly regarded. I think a lot of that kind of goes back to... Um, that book, Red Earth, White Lies. Um, okay. I forget the author off the top of my head, which I'm ashamed of because he worked here at CU Boulder. It's Vine Deloria Jr. Yeah, Vine Deloria <laughs> Jr. That's it. Um, what a name. Wow, wow Carlton. I can't I believe know. you don't remember that. <laughs> I know. I get so much I get so much for it over at NARF when they ask about, hey, have you read Vine Deloria's work? I'm like, yes, Narf? I have. Uh, yeah, NARF, the Native American Rights Fund. It's uh, They're located, their headquarters is right next to the anthropology yeah. building here at uh, Boulder. I have a couple of cousins that work there. Oh, okay. um, I'd never heard of that one. Yeah. Um, not many people do unless uh, <laughs> the government's being sued. But uh, so, yeah, how <laughs> so how has uh, how has the Lakota Nation like have, have accepted your work? Do they know about it? Like, yeah. How's it being received? So my family, which is probably about 60 people altogether, they know about it and they're very excited. They they've been practicing this ceremony called the Elk Dance for um, since 2015 at this point. Um, and I was kind of randomly flipping through a book one day and I was looking at some rock art images from the Black Hills region in South Dakota. And I realized that the images I was looking at looked like the ceremony that my family performs and that I have been a part of. Um, and so I took the book to them and I was like, oh, my God, you guys look at this. Like, this is what we do. And they were like, oh, my God, we had no idea that our ancestors made this rock art. There's sort of this disconnect, unfortunately, between rock art and, and Lakota people right now. And that's not to say that's everyone of the Lakota nation, but for my family, we weren't aware of that rock art existing. And so they're really excited to see where my work takes me. And I, and I plan on taking them to rock art sites for my dissertation to get their interpretation of the rock art. Rock art in the Northern Plain has the tendency to be sort of interpreted through a very Western, um, sometimes art historical lens, which I don't think really gives rock art the real interpretation that it needs. Because if Native people created it, why wouldn't Native people then interpret it? And that's not to say that Native contemporary Native people have been doing the exact same thing as Native ancestors, but there's probably some connections. And we know about those connections as Native people. So it's my family seems to be very excited about it. They were a little hesitant when I told them that I wanted to be an archaeologist. They were like, oh God, archaeologists and anthropologists are the worst. And I'm like, yes, I know. <laughs> but as a Native person, I hope that we can sort of start to change that narrative. And I currently, I think 
Lakota people are starting to understand that that relationship could potentially be repaired, um, which I'm excited about. So currently I'm working on getting my IRB um, approved with the Oglala Lakota Nation. And so um, I think that will allow me to do or maybe potentially talk to more people about the work that I'm doing. What's an IRB? An institutional review board is what it's called. But basically, um, do you want the real version or like my version of an IRB? Uh, <laughs> let's go with let's your go version, with, I guess. Yeah, your version for sure. Um, can I swear on the podcast? Is oh, that please. Wow. We already have the explicit. Yeah, we got the first explicit yes! tech on uh, ARCPodNet. So like we're, we're, we're going to hold on to that trophy as much as we can. Hell so just yeah. like Yeah, just <laughs> like keep the F words to a limit. To a limit okay. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> okay. only get so many of those per podcast. Well, let's be real. The IRB is a way for Indiana University to save its ass in case of a lawsuit is essentially what an IRB does. But it allows me as a researcher who's part of Indiana University to go and interview people and IU doesn't have to worry about my tribe potentially gotcha. suing them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty common wrongful. at most universities, yeah. right? Oh yeah, definitely. I think every university has, has an IRB at this point for any sort of scientific research. Now you brought something up that like always, I want to say grinds my gears, but gets me all heated is like the fact that indigenous people, nations haven't adopted anthropology or archaeology as like a means of interpretation because they see it as like racist science. And I always mm -hmm. think to myself, it's like, well, it wasn't archaeologists that wrote the treaties. Those were lawyers. And we have plenty of attorneys <laughs> now. Um, it yes. wasn't doctors like IHS doctors who did the forced sterilization without anyone's knowing. But we have people that work in the health health industry and who are nurses and doctors. And that like throughout the course of like indigenous history, any sort of profession or science was used against indigenous people. And like we've seen right. throughout the decades, indigenous people getting involved in those industries in order to help their nations. And then, but for some reason, like anthropology and archeology span has always been kept at a distance. Like, no, that is evil. That's wrong. Right. And it's like, if you put more people like yourself, Emily, like in these positions, like you can reframe the narrative and bring back a native voice to it. And so it's one of those things that always just try to, you know, drives me nuts, especially with the Pawnees having some pretty famous lawyers who still are on the bad bandwagon of like hating anthropology and archaeology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from Vine Delory again. He that wrote that book, uh, Red Earth, White Lies. And, you know, it could have been used as a vehicle for bringing Native people into the field. But instead, it was like really strongly against it. And it's still like that book was written early 2000s or late 90s and it, and it's still yeah. a very dominant paradigm in the heads of the of the educated um, indigenous and it's it's just infuriating it's like you know you guys still go to western hospitals in order to right. help like that's not indigenous medicine but like you you understand the value that it has so it's it's reframing anthropology and i think like me and you especially emily are part of this generation of indigenous people that are are really investigating archaeology and anthropology and turning it on its head like no no no, we need to have our own voice we need to start controlling the narrative or having a big part to play and i think we we're starting to see like kind of the fruits of a lot of that with larger tribal historic preservation offices that have you know indigenous um anthropology majors and you know mm -hmm. linguists are coming out like anthropology is now providing a service that i'm really hoping um continues to be a positive one. Oh yeah definitely it's it's fantastic what is going on in Indian country today. I think that there's a, there's very few native anthropologists and archaeologists, but I think that you're right. It's this next generation that's really going to push it to the next step. Well, um, you know, going going off of that, we're going to take our first break, but we'll come back to this conversation um, shortly. So thank you. Are you ready to upgrade your GPS so you can use your phone or tablet to map data? Want to use mapping software of choice on your tablet of choice? What about submeter or subfoot accuracy? Ready to get your GPS position fixed faster than you ever have in the past? I mean, come on, we all know how long that can take. Contact the GPS experts at Anatom GeoMobile Solutions to help transition to the latest mapping technology. Visit agsgis.com. That's agsgis.com or call one 800 980 Four six four nine. These guys are pretty great, and I've used some equipment from them. And Matt Alexander, who is the VP of Sales, is an awesome person and will help you figure out exactly what you need. So agsgis.com, 1-800-980-4649. Hey, everyone. 
everyone, Chris Webster here to tell you about all the awesome APN swag over at our T Public store. Check it out at arcpoddent.com slash shop. You'll find APN stuff, but also some great designs that we've had submitted. Get your Bruce Trigger Warning cell phone case or your Bottle Guide t-shirts. So find the link at arcpodnet.com slash shop. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop. Welcome back to episode three of a Life in Ruins podcast. Um, we are talking with Emily Van Alst. Um, and to kind of start the section off, um, I wanted to, I had a question earlier, um, but you guys were having such a great conversation. I didn't want to interrupt it at, at all. Um, but do you think that um, Native communities are less, are hesitant to interpret rock art or be be involved with the interpretation of rock art because they've been um, removed from their homelands or do you think there's some sort of because they don't live in the same areas anymore that there's differences and it might affect you know how they feel about rock art these days definitely i think that part of it too is that um native communities like i was talking about with my own community is just unaware of that rock art and and for my home community you know, the rock art that of that ceremony that we still perform is only, you know, 100 miles north. So it's not that far away, but it's far enough away that, you know, they weren't we weren't aware of it. Um, and so I think that for communities that have been mo- forcibly removed very far away, I think about the Miami of Indiana who were moved from Indiana to Oklahoma, which is, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, I think mm-hmm. that, that that definitely has an effect on how people may not even know about the rock art when it comes to interpretation i think that native people definitely have a particular perspective and can have a particular perspective on rock art you know rock art is different for every single tribe i think there's this idea that maybe native people have a connection but they see it the same as anthropologists which is this very like Uh, our historical Western approach. It's just images. Well, for a lot of Native folks, um, rock art can be, it can be alive. Um, It can be their ancestors talking to them. Um, There's different cultural protocols when it comes to interacting with rock art. For example, the Dinwoody tradition that you see a lot of in Wyoming um, is Shoshonean. And you're some, one of the cultural protocols is you're not allowed to point at the rock art because you are potentially inviting spirits um, to talk to you. That's and cool. It, yeah. So it's important to kind of remember those cultural protocols. Um, I know for the Lakota, um, we're not allowed to have certain animals at rock art sites like dogs because um, they have their own medicine um, that would interact, like could potentially interact with the rock art medicine. So yeah, rock art isn't just an image that you can look at, but it, it can be alive and it can have meaning and it can you can interact with it in a very different way as a native person than if you're just going and looking at an image on a rock. And it can be interpreted in different ways, right? Yeah. To different people and mean different things. Can I say something about it real quick? Because like, I've, I, the one of the craziest experiences I've ever had with a member of the public was actually looking at Denwoody rock art. Okay. It (laughs) was, yeah. Oh my God. It was, it was amazing. So it was like the eclipse of 2017, Boyan River Indian Reservation, which is Shoshone, yep. and uh, the Arapaho are just kind of chilling there. And so, like, I went, I went up with my, co- I went up my, with my cousins who are who are Shoshone, and I used to live in Wind River, and they're like, "Hey, come out!" So we did. And because I'm an archaeologist, hey, do you want to go see the rock art? And it, it had been a while since I'd seen it, um, so I was like, "Yeah, sure." Um, so we went up to go see the Denwoody rock art, and we we picked up because the trail to get there, if you don't have a four by four, kind of sucks. So we picked up a couple. Uh, people from Las Vegas and we were talking to them and we were like, oh, my my cousin was like, oh, Carlton's an archaeologist. Like, oh, my God, this is great. We can talk about it. So we're looking at the rock art and I and I shit you not. This person was like, well, you, like I read this this article about rock art and, uh, you know, where you get these these red stains from. And I was like, oh, like, please do tell. <laughs> and oh, and to sum it up, the story was that like ancient Great Basin Indians would paint the butts of sheep red and where the sheep sat down or pressed up against the rock art. Like that's what the impression was, was like sheep butt paint. And I, I, (laughs) dude, yes, I I, I was, I sat there and my cousin looked at me like, Oh, weird. He's like, what? And I was like, (laughs) I would really love to see the article, but like, to my knowledge, sheep, bighorn sheep were never domesticated. So like, I don't know how they would do that. And like a lot of these red impressions are like high up. So unless they put a sheep on a ladder and like, 
bulldoze styled a sheep's ass into the rock <laughs> face. Like I don't see how this happened. And it was this, just, was and like, I, this was like, yeah, dude, this is this was like two, three years ago, and I was just sitting there and I got in the car with my cousin. He was like, What the fuck are those white people talking about? And I was like, <laughs> I had no idea, Sonny. Like that, that's oh, that's God. nope, just nope. But yeah, so yeah, Den Woody Rock Art. It's great. Go see it. So it's, that's like the equivalent yeah. of like photocopying like a ram's butt <laughs> and then yeah. printing that off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much. Just, yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely <laughs> Seems how legit. we should interpret that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. There. I mean, people just have this weird idea, like. Because they don't, nobody really knows what rock art is. People have just made up the craziest stuff when it comes to in- their interpretation. And everyone thinks that they get an interpretation, especially when it comes to Native American rock art, which is just bullshit at this point. I'm not, I'm not here for it. So this is why I want to bring Native people to rock art sites to actually interpret their ancestors images so i mean to be honest like i wasn't a huge fan of rock art um and i think that just comes from my like wyoming um mm, yeah. upbringing with you know like bob kelly mm-hmm. and uh and I but like bob at this year it's game art or rock no yeah, art. yeah absolutely but like you, you it's like it's a it, it's really interpretive to understand these things and like that's something that sure you know they just don't really necessarily like totally uh, deal with but like when i went to plains conference in san antonio and i was really bummed that you and mac weren't there emily i know that the, our, our our presentation was on lower pecos rock art and when i first sat down for this presentation i was just like oh here we go <laughs> but like it was f- fascinating that she was able to tie in this lower pecos rock art with Aztec with the Aztec origin story and like the belief system. And I was, I was totally sold. I was like, Oh my God, like this is actually legit. When I found out that Carolyn Boyd was giving that presentation, Mm -hmm. I like cried. I was like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? Why am I missing this? Carolyn Boyd is huge in North American rock art. Like the work she does is just impeccable. She was phenomenal. Like I was totally bought in and I was sitting next to Dr. Marcel Kornfeld and like, that whole experience itself was just amazing. And I totally gained this uh, appreciation for rock art and my buddy, Devin Pettigrew, who's my lab mate also got bought in and almost every day now, like he, he's in a, I've never heard the term lab mate. That's lab mate. Like, like, well, he's he's in my office. He's in my office. He's one of, he's one of Doug's other students. And like, we've been doing this class in, in Pawnee archeology span and like Devin has totally immersed himself in Pawnee mythology and belief systems and rock art. And it compares it with like the, Dingen speaker suit this Dingen suin am i saying that right like the oto osage oh, yeah yeah i know what you're talking about i don't know how to yeah, pronounce it either that, yeah that group of suin speakers and like and he's every it's it's rainbows all day with him rainbow serpents rainbows arrows <laughs> lightning and it's just like devin that's great i gotta work on something else but like it's just been absolutely phenomenal and like that and i've gained a huge appreciation for your research and the way that you're conducting it just just kind of through these experiences within the last year of like these things actually matter mm-hmm. to contemporary indigenous people because there's they actually do tell a narrative they're not yeah. just you know these aren't doodles right exactly and i think that the where that comes from is in the sort of 1960s and 70s everyone thought that people were just like getting high on whatever drugs and like creating rock art and it was shamanism and i'm like oh my god no um and unfortunately some of that that narrative has sort of spilled over into, you know, contemporary rock art research. Um, My hope is that this new generation, including myself, will sort of really think about cultural context when it comes to rock art and not just what we think Native or ancestors potentially were just doing. But yeah, it's rock art has just been seen as like this mysterious, like image of the past or whatever. And I, I think that, rock art can be really important and really help us sort of construct this narrative of the past that archaeologists are really interested in. And kind of building off of that, um, so could you define what indigenous archaeology is? And, you know, as you were mentioning before, um, you know, how how can that be beneficial to archaeology or anthropology kind of going forward in in the future? So I like to use um, Joe Watkins' definition of indigenous archaeology, with, which is uh, an archaeology that is with, by, and for indigenous people. Joe is probably, 
I guess, grandfather at this point of indigenous archaeology was one of the first indigenous archaeologists to write about what indigenous archaeology could be. And so indigenous archaeology is not just a theory, but I think it it really is about method and praxis, which is is including indigenous voices and indigenous communities. For me, that includes at the very first step of an archaeological project, whether that be an academic one or a cultural resource management project. I think Native people need to be consulted at the very first step and not just consulted as in like, oh, we asked a few Native people um, about you know, this pipeline project or potentially this research, but actually including indigenous folks throughout the entire process of whatever project that might be. And historically they've been like, like historically they've been left out of those conversations exactly. no matter what it was like CRM, you know, the yeah. academic research. Yeah. I mean, native people haven't really started to be a part of the, the conversations and part of projects and probably until the nineties really. And so things have been moving in a better direction um, and that relationship is starting to be healed between archaeologists and, and Native people. But I think there's a there's a lot more to go. Um, and I think one of the main things for Indigenous archaeology is having Native people be archaeologists. It's not just archaeologists and then Native people, the sort of mentality of being, you know, two different groups. But I think that there are people who exist in this sort of in-between, like me, like Carlton, um, like a few other indigenous archaeologists. And I think that's going to be really the key, like next step in indigenous archaeology is having more native archaeologists um, and include and and not just having consultation, but having engagement. I was talking to a First Nations archaeologist and he was like consultation. People say they've consulted native people. They've lied and said they consulted native people, but really engagement and, and including native voices and native communities every step of the way. And that's that's a huge distinguishing factor is like that dichotomy between consultation and collaboration. Mm-hmm. Like those are two very different models for for engaging indigenous communities because, I mean, just to sum it up, uh, consultation just means you show up, you can show up to a tribal meeting, say, hey, this is what I want to do and this is what I found. Like, do you guys support it or do you guys want anything to do with it? And the tribe can say yes or no. And regardless of what they say, the researcher can just do what they want. But they said, well, I've consulted, like I've, I've consulted. Yep. And but collaboration is a completely different method of like indigenous people are there from start to finish and help and contribute to conclusions rather than just getting approval. Um, and I think that's a difference in like pa- in the power that, that, uh, that the people have at the table. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm part of a project with Mesa Verde right now that's under a collaboration model. Um, and the tribes, when we reached out to them, were like really confused because um, they were like, all right, so what, what's the game plan? We're like, no, nah, you're going to be part of the game plan. And they were like, what do you mean we're part of the game plan? Like, no, you're going to be with us from beginning to end. You're going to have this whole process is going to be with you guys helping us to figure this problem out. And they were, they were just confused. And then once they got over the shock, they were totally excited about it. You said huh. consultated. <laughs> oh my God. Consul- con- consulted. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I knew what you meant though. So it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, that's that PhD education right there. It's doing you real well. <laughs> it's, yep, it's the end of the semester. Yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually working on a project. I fly out Saturday with Salish Kootenai College. We're trying to get a rock art field school um, off the ground. And so we have two uh, native faculty that we're going to be working with. And so, um, and we're also meeting with the Salish Kootenai Cultural Committee as well while we're there. And so it'll be very much collaborative and it won't just be us consulting and then doing whatever we, we want as Indiana university researchers. So um, I think that a lot of people are, are starting to do the more collaborative engagement method, not just consultation. What's the U uh, S tribal designation for the Salish? Uh, what do you mean? Like federal? Like, They're federally wh- recognized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're I mean, like, recognized. is I mean, like, is that the name they call themselves, or is that like the name that's in the treaties? Um, I'm not. It's the Flathead Indian Reservation. So Salish Kootenai College is on the Flathead Reservation, and it's the Interior Salish and the Kootenai. So it's two different tribes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was like something like, you know, there's the federal designation, which is Pawnee, and then there's what the Pawnee call themselves. So I didn't know if it was like 
one of one of those aspects of you know, of uh, what yeah anyways yeah i think and where, they, where are these tribes located sorry I didn't, oh they're <laughs> nations in... connor nations nations sorry <laughs> nations no i thank you for correcting me i appreciate that <laughs> um they are in northern um montana northwest montana so about an hour north of missoula montana which is where university of montana is very cool yeah. Dope. Uh, well, I saw on your uh, your CV when we were talking about it that you're into um, gender and feminist archaeology. Um, let's. I was going to ask the question: How does rock art kind of inform our interpretations of gender in the past? That's something that I don't think like the public is much aware of. You know, dude, I'm not even aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say this as a caveat: it is really hard to understand gender from rock art right okay. like we've talked about how rock art is incredibly interpretive um and uh, and very subjective um and so it's hard to figure out exactly how gender plays into into rock art but if i if we think about meg conkey's work who's she's well known for rock art research um sure. in paleolithic yeah. france um as well as feminist uh, archaeology but rock art's very much been interpreted by men. And so it's just sort of this inherent bias of, oh yeah, men must have created these hunting scenes because cool. they're trying yeah. to get power for hunting. Well, we don't 100% know that. Meg Conkey argues, we will never truly know exactly what people were thinking when they were creating these images and what those images mean. Um, but for me, I'm looking more at historic slash proto-historic time frame for rock art. And so I can use the ethnographic record as a way to interpret the past. Not to say that the ethnographic record here in the in North America isn't riddled with male bias. <laughs> um, Tyranny because, of the testes. <laughs> so, uh, Never yeah. Heard that one. Oh my God, that's a new one. I haven't heard that one either. <laughs> It's great though. Uh, I can't. I can't get credit. I, I read it in like a, a primatology book or something that looked at chip behavior and yeah. So yeah. Anyways, awesome. tyranny of the testes. Tyranny of the testes. Primatology book. Huh? Wow. All right. Um, but yeah. So my hope is that you know because native women have been largely ignored in the ethnographic record as well as the archaeological one. My hope is to um, talk to Lakota women who who and other native women potentially about the rock art. Linnea Sundstrom has done a lot of work with looking at gender and rock art and and using the ethnographic record to sort of interpret rock art. And, and then she has figured out that native women potentially created some of these images that we're seeing. So yeah. um, it is incredibly hard to do. Um, I didn't realize how hard it was until I got to grad school and was <laughs> like, oh boy, I have just wow, this is going to be tough. But I think that it can be doable depending on the time frame that you're working in. Cool. Very, very yeah, cool. Cause... Very cool. Yeah. So um, at, at this point, we're going to go to our second break. Um, so gonna, we'll see us on gonna, the other side. Yeah, right. we're going to consultate with uh, Emily some more. <laughs> 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 Hey, I'm Chris Webster, and this is your Wild Note Tip of the Month for October 2019. As we move into the off-season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, you might be wondering what to do with your fancy digital data management software. Well, here are some ideas. Wild Note can be used to help catalog artifacts in the lab. Just export a pivot table and import into your existing database. Create new forms to manage proposals and report writing tasks. Not all forms for data collection have to be exported. They can just be used for organization and internal data gathering. Finally, test out new forms for the next field season. Check out our safety forms or build your own. If you aren't using WildNote yet, head over to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for all your digital data collection needs and a free trial. Hey everybody, Chris Webster here. And as we head into the off season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, it's time to buckle down and write those reports. As we all know, the time you work on the report has to be accounted for. That's where Timeular comes in. Timeular is a time tracking app, but it also has a physical component. Just flip the Timeular cube to the side that represents what you're doing, and it stops time on one task and starts it on another. Check out Timeular over at arcpodnet.com slash Timeular. That's arcpodnet.com slash T-I-M-E-U-L-A-R. Well, thank you listeners for making it through the first and second sessions and coming out on the 
third session of this podcast. Um, we are talking with Emily Van Als, and this is episode three. Um, so to start it off, you had mentioned this term ethnographic record. So could you briefly explain, you know, kind of what that is? So the ethnographic record, wow, I use it so much as a term that I don't even know I can define it. Um, I guess I would define it as basically... <laughs> Like maybe like the modern observed, like, like yeah. that's where as far as I can get with words with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess interviews and inf- information from native people that was recorded um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s um, is sort of the area that I'm focused on within the ethnographic record. I mean, any sort of ethnography that's been recorded or any interviews, I would say, um, which is essentially what ethnography is. It can also be participant observations. So being part of a community and writing about that community, um, I think all can include can be included in the ethnographic record. So it's it's like this broad term that's like uh, basically information observed or participated in about native communities that's ultimately published that we as archaeologists and anthropologists you can use to study things exactly that's a much past, better yeah. <laughs> much better definition than mine <laughs> no it's a, it's okay i i had I, if i kind of put you on the spot so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so like, I'm, is, I'm curious oh. about your research that you do in the northern plains and looking at rock art is can the rock art be dated are there dates associated with it Wait, um, hold up. There's an ice cream truck outside my house right now, and I'm really psyched. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, thanks for that. Okay, moving on. <laughs> okay, it's gone. We're good to go. Sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, oh God. rock art sites. Can they be dated? Are they dated? What are we dealing with here in terms of time? So rock art is really hard to date on the on the northern plains because the erosion is really bad as well as preservation efforts. Um, uranium net, uh, mining is also a real issue, and so a lot of rock art, um, unfortunately, has been destroyed because of natural resource extraction um, out west. But if you have pictographs, which is painted rock art, you can date the organic material that was potentially used. So um, red and yellow um, pigment slash ochre um, was used a lot on the plains. Um, So if you have that, you can potentially date that. But it's also important to keep in mind that native folks might not want um, you taking a tiny piece of that pigment Um, because it might interrupt the sort of relationship that the rock art has with the sort of larger landscape. Um, But that's one way that you can that you can date. You can also use the ethnographic record to date things. So the ceremony that I was talking about that's been depicted in rock art, that was probably created in the 1700s, potentially a little bit earlier than that. But those are the sort of the main the two main methods of dating rock art on the plains. You can do like relative dating too, which is like you, so yeah. you date associated features or something, which is, you know, might be a harder way to tie those together. Yeah, it can be really hard because when it comes to rock art, a lot of native folks, well, we don't, native ancestors potentially were creating different, um, they're called different episodes. So like there might be one image and then like a hundred years later, someone else might come along and create another image. Um, we sort of see potentially people going back to the same rock art site over and over again. Um, and it's called superimposition, where you have different rock art traditions that are all in one area. Um, and so it can be really hard to figure out when each image was created and how they interact. And so, and, and then if you have associated features or associated artifacts, how can you figure out what image goes with what artifact? It can be really difficult. So why the 1700s in, in particular? Um, I think 1700s because they did some interviews with some Lakota and Cheyenne people, and that's when they would have been on the, on the Northern Plains and could potentially been doing certain ceremonies that's not 100 percent certain but that's how 
those petroglyphs have been interpreted. So that's about the same time as the uh, Great Suan Empire invasion of the <laughs> plains, right? <laughs> You should call it that. Is that commonly referred to as that? Is that? <laughs> it is to <Sir> Carlton, apparently. <laughs> in, in Pawnee and Arikara circles, that's what we call it. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't call it an invasion. Just, you know, we just moved out there. It's fine. <laughs> Started killing the locals. Yep. <sighs> well, you know. This, it's fine now, right, Carlton? We're best friends, so... <laughs> indeed, indeed. We're not, we're not enemies any longer. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we're not bitter about what happened in the past, nope. <laughs> no, it was 100 years ago, it's fine. It's fine. 100 years time, ago, Time nothing. heals everything, that's what I hear. Yeah, just, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just, it just took time. Just, some, Lots just of time. 100 years. <laughs> Few generations, it's mm-hmm. fine. <laughs> But yeah, uh, moving away from that, um, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! It seems um, like those differences have really been resolved. <laughs> it was, you know, it's like one of those things you watch dances with wolves, and like you know, oh the Pawnees yes. just bitch and moan about the Pawnee scene like all day. Oh yeah, we uh, we skipped that part in our household. Oh, I love dances with wolves, though. It's so I bet good. You do. I bet you do. <laughs> Best movie ever. <laughs> Speaking of representation, are right things... Right now, I, gonna... <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you guys are joking about. <laughs> oh my god. No, there's this scene in Dances with Wolves when the Pawnees do like a early morning raid and just get like their asses handed to them. And it's like a, a pretty pivotal part in that whole in that whole movie. You know, there's there's inaccuracies, but that's just expected with Hollywood. Oh yeah. I mean that movie the reason I like that movie is because they had Albert White Hat translate all the Lakota. And so the ce- like the scenes where they're speaking Lakota, which is the majority of the scenes, which I think is really awesome are in like the Lakota is correct. And so you're actually hearing the oh. language, which is really awesome. Um, but it's also very much like the white savior complex. And at the very end of the, the movie, like the Lakota are portrayed in a very particular way as it's the Pawnee. And so, you know, it's very much like a Western sort of movie. And in the very end, they talk about how all the native people like, a pen, like died off and there's no longer any native people which we know is not true um so it's very 90s white savior complex i mean pocahontas came out two years after that movie and so rough it, that was that was the narrative of the 90s when it came to native people in film well the guy so. that plays 10 bears in that film floyd crow westerman he's he's yeah. sue isn't he yeah 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 i think so yeah yeah he wrote a great song called Custer Died for Your Sins. It's, love it. <laughs> Let me ask the love real it. question, though. Was Wes Studi in that movie? I think so. He yes, was. he plays he was. the Pawnee. Okay. The Pawnees don't even <laughs> speak Pawnee. They speak fucking Arikara. Like, it's <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's not even like, yeah, I can understand that. But like, yeah, I mean, the Arikara are northern cousins who like to pretend like they're not Pawnees, but like their language <laughs> is, is different. Um, and so if there's any Arikara listens out there, it's like, calm down. Um, <laughs> oh my god but yeah Wes Duty plays the like very angry Pawnee person in the wa- Pawnee warrior or whatever in okay. the uh, in the uh, in Dances of Wolves yeah and he's Cherokee out of all yeah things. he's he was, Cherokee you know, yeah it's a he's whole just thing. always in the I mean he's in what is yes. the other one uh, uh, Last of the Mohicans he's in that one yep all over the See, place there's, there's a short list of people that uh, get I figured it's not things. really a deep bench you know <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the same guys, but like for um, what the hell was it with Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio? Revenant. Um, Revenant. Revenant. Yeah, Revenant. they he brought. Wasn't in that. Yeah, well, he wasn't, but um, they actually brought out um, lang- uh, Pawnee language coaches for that one. From um, IU, so actually, actually. Yeah, so oh, they cool. did that. Yeah, I had a oh, I had cool. a relative that was a part of it, and uh, so there was a, there was a whole that was pretty cool. And then we adopted Leo into the tribe because that's how it goes. So you know the Southwesterners <laughs> can go. Fuck themselves with uh, Johnny Depp. We got, we got Leo, boy. Really going we got oh Leo. God. And apparently, there's a rumor that Jason Momoa might have a Pawnee grandmother, great grandmother, and we're trying to verify it because if we could bring him in, like I would be so fucking happy. You're trying oh to get God. him on this podcast? 
Dude, I would fucking love to have him. I mean, geez, oh, like you we could do it. Gotcha. Nation. Yeah, yeah like, Jason Momoa, you're out there and listening to our podcast. <laughs> we want you. Yes, get Jason Momoa, that beautiful man. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, it was it was great because like on the on the Pawnee Facebook chats, they're like, how do we tell if he's uh <laughs> if he's Pawnee or not? And everyone's like, have him take off his shirt, and we're just like, all right. Oh my god, <laughs> was some grandma on your Pawnee chat? Oh, thing? all of like, all the women, the women were going nuts. They were just like, oh yeah, we'll take him. Like who cares? <laughs> we don't god. even need verification. If he wants to say it, we'll let him in. <laughs> we'll let him in. <laughs> we'll do a ceremony. It'll be fine. We'll do, yeah, we'll just bring him in. That's just perfect. It's like, yeah, we'll take oh. Aquaman. We got Aquaman and Leo. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> yeah, amazing! We're, it's, it's it's been a fun time. That is for sure. I guess speaking of fun times, let's pull it back to the uh, <laughs> the questions at hand here. But um, I guess for like, I guess Connor and I are non-native archaeologists, and obviously non-native, I guess layman to the indigenous <laughs> world. Um, or like white people. That whole, yeah, so I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> dodge that one, but yes. As a white person, uh, I guess half white, considering on who you talk to, what textbook you read, what can we do to, like, help contribute and help make indigenous archaeology more, like, on the forefront or, like, more, you know, just noticed? I think y'all doing stuff like this, um, like interviewing Native folks um, and and getting our voices out there, I think it's awesome that like you and Connor have Carlton as one of your co-hosts. I think that's really important. Like putting native people on equal footing and equal ground. And I think just He's like, abrasive. well, Carlton, <laughs> we all know Carlton is a lot of person, but we love him anyway. Um, <laughs> but that's yeah, what I, you, I mean, that's what you said about me when you first, when you first met me when you, when uh, at, at Plains, right? Oh yeah. I was like, Oh my God, he's Pawnee. He's so extra. I can't even deal with him. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, David. Uh, yeah, we're doing a podcast. Yeah, you're on it. Okay, cool. Bye. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Literally how that conversation went. Oh, oh God. Um, but yeah, I think just, you know, if you're teaching a class, like, are there indigenous people included on your syllabus? Like, you know, sure. if you don't, if you don't know something like that relates to native issues, like, contact a native person and i'm not saying put all of that sort of labor onto a native person but most native people who are in academia are happy to talk about native issues it's part of the reason we're doing this whole academia education thing is to you know make people more aware of indigenous issues and so yeah i think just centering native voices elevating native voices um and being aware of native issues reading up on them i think is really key and actually talking and listening to native people which anthropologists are not very good at. I think it's gotten better though since the passage yeah. of back pro. Like there's there's definitely more archaeologists and anthropologists that are like in order to get access to these resources, like we need to do the right thing. And I think we've seen like especially because me and you were both born in like the post NAGPRA era. So right. I guess for maybe some of the older people they still have some of those resentments. But I mean yeah. you know, one What's of the NAGPRA? coolest oh, geez, the Native American Graves and Repatriations Act of nineteen ninety. Okay. Um Yep, and that basically said that any um, objects of cultural significance belonging to federal agencies or federally funded museums had to be cataloged and repatriated back to the tribes that they're from. And that was all started because of uh, uh, actually the Sand Creek Massacre here in um, Colorado where a bunch of Cheyenne were civilians were ran down by the cavalry and the Cheyenne civilians were like actually – protected under the u.s like they were peaceful termed peaceful indians and it was like a whole thing they basically found out that there was a bunch of skeletons sitting in the smithsonian yeah. um and it, it created this huge huge uh, call to action um so and because of that um uh, one of the the great things about it is that there's been so much more collaboration between museums and anthropologists with indigenous communities and also indigenous people being involved in museums in anthropology so okay. you know yeah, and I think also this new generation of archaeologists want just want to do the the right thing, right? Like a law doesn't have to force people to be ethical and be collaborative. Like they can just you can just do it because you want to do it. Um, and yeah. that's sort of to say that you know I think sometimes there's this idea that white people can't do indigenous archaeology, and I just don't think that that is true. I think as long as 
non-native people are collaborating with native people, I think then you you can be a part of indigenous archaeology. All you need okay. is a Tonto. Oh my god. Everyone just needs oh. a, si- a native sidekick. <laughs> I'm not going to go on the record saying that. <laughs> <laughs> This um, podcast does not represent the views of David and I. <laughs> <laughs> um, before before we finish, you had mentioned earlier something that I had never heard of, but like I I, I I know what it is now that you said it. But like the white savior like theme of the '90s, I didn't really know that was like a wave of you know like zeitgeist in the '90s. So like, where do you see that going now, and like where is that changing? Um, I think in mo- uh I don't know. I, I said that in regards to film of films okay. of the nineties. And that's comes from talking to my dad about native representation, um, natives represented in film in the 1990s. But I mean that the most recent example, I think would probably be the avatar movie. Um, okay. where that's with wolves in space, essentially. Oh God, yeah. That's in space. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I wrote a paper in eighth grade, I think, called Dances with Pokatar, which was <laughs> comparing <laughs> Dances with Wolves, Pocahontas, and Avatar. <laughs> yes. 14 oh year old me was very proud of that. Um, <laughs> I think but, that's going to be the title of this podcast. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> Dances with Pokatar. Um, holy God. Yeah. Um, but this, I think sometimes the white savior complex isn't just in film. I think it can be seen in other facets, sometimes in, in academia, but I think it's, it's less and less because you have more native people coming to the table and native people telling their narrative and their stories. You see it a lot in, I feel like in social media, you know, kind of Instagram people going um, to other countries on mission trips or or whatever it is. And yeah, there's, there's kind of,